Every bite of food you take starts an incredible journey that ends with your cells having the energy that they need to keep you alive. That sandwich you had for lunch is right now being converted into the molecular fuel that powers your heartbeat, your thoughts, and even your ability to watch this video. Welcome to Seismic, I'm Matt, and today we're exploring cellular respiration, the process that turns food into cellular energy. This isn't just about biology, it's about understanding how you're literally powered by chemistry happening inside trillions of cells every single second. Let's unlock the secrets of cellular energy production. Cellular respiration is essentially controlled combustion, breaking down glucose in the presence of oxygen to release energy. The overall equation shows glucose plus oxygen yielding carbon dioxide, water, and most importantly, ATP. Unlike burning wood in a fire, which releases energy all at once as heat and light, cellular respiration carefully captures energy in the chemical bonds of ATP molecules. It's like the difference between exploding dynamite and carefully extracting energy from a battery. Big difference. Cellular respiration is essentially the opposite of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis stores energy by building glucose from carbon dioxide and water. Cellular respiration releases that stored energy by breaking glucose back down. The goal is making ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the universal energy currency of cells. Just like you use money to buy different things, cells use ATP to power everything from muscle contractions to building protein. This process happens in three main stages, mostly in the mitochondria, those powerhouse organelles we've learned just a little bit about. Each stage extracts even more energy from glucose molecules than the last. Stage one is glycolysis, which literally means sugar splitting. This happens in the cell's cytoplasm, outside the mitochondria, and breaks one glucose molecule into two smaller pyruvate molecules. Glycolysis has two phases. First, the cell actually invests or spends two ATP molecules to get the process started, like spending money to make money. Then the payoff phase produces four ATP molecules for an overall net gain of two. Glycolysis also produces NADH, an electron carrier that will be crucial in later stages. Think of NADH like a rechargeable battery that gets charged up here and will release its energy later. Breaking one 6-carbon glucose into two 3-carbon pyruvates releases some energy, but most of the glucose's energy is still locked up in those pyruvate molecules. Some organisms, especially bacteria, stop here and use fermentation to regenerate the molecules needed to keep glycolysis running. But for maximum energy extraction, pyruvate heads to the mitochondria for stages 2 and 3. Stage two happens inside the mitochondria. First, each pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA, releasing carbon dioxide. Part of the CO2 you breathe out actually comes from this step. The Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle, is like a molecular recycling center. Acetyl-CoA joins with a four carbon molecule to form a six carbon molecule called citrate. As the six carbon molecule moves through the cycle, it gradually loses carbon atoms as CO2 while transforming energy to electron carriers like NADH and FADH2. By the end, we're back at oxaloacetate, ready to start the cycle all over again. Each turn of the Krebs cycle produces some ATP directly, but more importantly, it loads up electron carriers with energy. Since each glucose produces two pyruvates, the Krebs cycle turns twice per glucose molecule. The real payoff comes next. All these loaded electron carriers, the NADH and FADH2, head to stage three, where their stored energy gets converted into tons of ATP. Stage three is where the magic really happens. The electron transport chain is a series of protein complexes embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane that creates a cellular power plant. NADH and FADH2 from previous stages donate their high energy electrons to the transport chain. These electrons move from protein to protein, releasing energy at each step, like a controlled avalanche. The energy from moving electrons powers protein pumps that move hydrogen ions across the membrane, creating a concentration gradient. It's like pumping water uphill to create potential energy. ATP synthase, an amazing molecular machine, uses this proton gradient like a water wheel. As protons flow back through ATP synthase, it spins and combines ADP with phosphate to make ATP. Oxygen plays a crucial role as the final electron acceptor. Electrons that have traveled through the 
entire chain combined with oxygen and hydrogen to form water, the H2O in our equation. This stage produces the most ATP, about 28 to 34 molecules per glucose. Combined with earlier stages, one glucose molecule yields approximately 32 to 38 ATP molecules total. Now that's a good trade. Oxygen is essential for maximum energy production. Without oxygen, the electron transport chain can't function, and cells can only use glycolysis and fermentation, producing just 2 ATP per glucose instead of 32 to 38. This is why you breathe faster during exercise. Your muscle cells need more oxygen to run cellular respiration efficiently and produce the ATP needed for muscle contractions. When oxygen runs low during intense exercise, your muscle cells switch to anaerobic respiration, producing lactic acid instead of CO2 and water. This is less efficient and causes the burning sensation in overworked muscles. Some bacteria can use other molecules besides oxygen as the final electron acceptors, but oxygen provides the most energy. That's one reason why complex, energy-demanding organisms like yourself or animals require so much oxygen. Remember, breathing brings oxygen into your cells and removes carbon dioxide, both essential for cellular respiration. Every breath you take directly supports the energy production happening in your cells. Right now, cellular respiration is powering everything you do. Your brain cells are using ATP to process this information, your heart muscle cells are using ATP to pump blood, and your digestive system is using ATP to help break down your last meal. Different foods provide different starting materials. Carbohydrates get converted to glucose directly. Fats and proteins can also be broken down and fed into cellular respiration pathways at various points. Athletes train to make cellular respiration more efficient, better oxygen delivery, more mitochondria in muscle cells, and improved waste removal. It's literally optimizing cellular energy production. Some medical conditions actually affect cellular respiration though. Carbon monoxide poisoning blocks oxygen transport, while certain genetic disorders affect mitochondrial function. Understanding cellular respiration helps doctors diagnose and treat these conditions. Temperature, oxygen availability, and food supply all affect cellular respiration rates. This helps explain why warm-blooded animals need more food and why high-altitude training can improve athletic performance. Cellular respiration is one of life's most fundamental processes, the bridge between the food you eat and the energy your cells need. From glycolysis in the cytoplasm to the electron transport chain in mitochondria, it's a perfectly coordinated system. Understanding cellular respiration connects you to bigger biology concepts, energy flow and ecosystems, the importance of oxygen and evolution, and how all life depends on converting environmental resources into usable energy. Maybe you'll become a biochemist studying these pathways, a doctor treating metabolic disorders, or a researcher developing new ways to optimize cellular energy production. Now, don't forget to subscribe and let us know down in the comments what amazes you most about how cells extract energy from food. Thanks for exploring cellular energy production with Seismic. Want to explore more about cellular processes and energy flow? Check out our complete science curriculum at seismic.com, where every student can learn, grow, and achieve.